Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the Dow Jones Industrial 30 average weekly chart. And uh, what I've marked out here is a uh, kind of interesting pattern that's forming here. You can see this blue arrow is pointing to a initial um, break in the MACD down below the zero line. You can see that right there. And what we got after that was a bounce. And then uh, after that bounce, we had a resumption of the downtrend. You can see that the uh, majority of the downtrend in the MACD occurred during this smaller uh, downtrend. Whereas once we got this final down leg, then you can see that the, the bulk of the selling uh, from here down to here, that happened during this final down leg. Now you can see here we're lining up to do the same sort of thing here. Uh, they're very close parallels and uh, that's going to give us a target somewhere down around in here. Now if the percentages hold, if we have something similar, now we could have something worse. Uh, we could take out these lows. Uh, but if we have something similar and get a bounce, then the target price is going to be 8500 on the Dow based upon the uh, 50 4% uh, decline that we got from top to bottom here. And you can see that was in a fairly short amount of time, uh, roughly from uh, October 1st of 2008 down to March of uh, 2009. Uh, so really just about a six month period, uh, the entire thing uh, happened. Uh, for this uh, top here, then you can see that the top was put in around um, that would be about June. So this one's already running longer than the last one. So we're kind of overdue. If we get that, what does it mean? Well, it's going to mean a lot of things. It's going to mean that um, the stock play is going to be completely played out. And the Myra thing, like I said, I've talked about the Myra thing before, where the government guarantees you a return uh, based on the Treasury and them printing money. Uh, that's going to start looking pretty good when we see how far the market goes down, if it goes down. Now let's do a cross here. Of I want to look at a number of charts, but let's start off with a cross of the uh, silver spot with the Dow. Because this is one I like to keep my eye on because I point out in the past that I think that these are going to uh, meet up and cross over ultimately. Now, it's kind of interesting because you can see that the silver is still just trending down slowly, trying to turn around, but hasn't, whereas the Dow's moving towards it quite rapidly. If we saw gold, it would be a, a bit of a different story, but we're still expecting a reversal of paper and physical to happen. Now, the crude oil price, this is a really disturbing chart. Uh, I, I don't know whether this is more disturbing or the Baltic dry and the, the rumors about no ships being in the Atlantic uh, is more disturbing. I mean this is depression type stuff and we've had some calls recently from some forecasters talking about things like $10 oil, $10 uh, barrel oil, uh, which would just be absolutely unbelievable. We've had it before. I don't think it's going to come up on this monthly chart. Um, the lowest we get here is about 25 bucks. But we had that 12 low in oil back in the 90s, I believe it was. And then we had a tremendous rally from there. So it is possible. Uh, what does it say about the economy? I, I don't even know what it says about the economy. I'm going to have to do a, a video following up on um, this uh, Baltic dry crash and these lack of ships. So let's look at some other indices here. Um, we've got currencies continuing to collapse. I uh, want to take a look here real quick at the Russian ruble. Uh, the ruble is still weak. Now it's interesting that Russia's response to the crisis and the, I point out when it started to happen was it was uh, it uh, coincided uh, almost exactly with the um, Ukrainian crisis, which happened there in, in the fall. And, and then, uh, or it may have been the fall of 2014. Um, but uh, the Russian currency was just completely blown out. And 
it uh, just continues to fall. Um, will it go into new lows? Well, it could, but I think the Russian rates are all the way up at around 18%. It's, they may end up attracting some money uh, to their currency. Let's see if we can get the Glencore chart because the Glencore chart is really starting to look like um, a, let's get into the daily here. It's really starting to form up one of those descending flags. I mean, this is a ugly, ugly flag we have here in Glencore. And you can see 72, the low, we're, we're getting near that all time low. You can see the MACDs completely rolled over. Um, Let's pull up the, the FinViz copper chart real quick because, uh, as I said before, when the Glencore crisis started, uh, the copper chart was still, in my opinion, was, was very, very overvalued. So if we look at copper here, you can see that it's it's corrected, it's rolled over, and it's it's gone into new lows. We're down below that two price. But if we go out on the long term, you can see that the target that I was looking at in comparison to oil was this price here, nearly down to one. So that actually gives copper quite a long ways to fall. And that's gonna be really ugly when we're talking about the bonds for Glencore and the rest of the commodity producers. It's also going to have an incredible effect on the mining companies. It's, it's going to be unprecedented if we get a price of um, nearly one on copper. And we've had some amazing prices. I showed you before the price that we got on natural gas. Uh, unprecedented, you can see, ticking lower than even in the 90s. Again, we looked at, at crude oil, same thing, absolutely ghastly chart. Just the worst thing that anybody can imagine. It just keeps going down. So the story's really, really bad, and it's getting worse. So I wanted to take you over to the main story of the night, and that's going to be this Kid Dynamite article. And I'm not, I don't know if you remember Kid Dynamite, but he's kind of a, well, maybe he's a precious metal shell. I'm not really sure. He, he's, in this article, I actually tend to agree with him. He's, he's trying to debunk this concept of the registered uh, ounces and what that means. And I'll read a little bit of the intro and then the meat of it here. He says, it's been a while since I wrote a post designed to help the followers of the many precious metal charlatans out there who try to make a buck by selling lies and confirmation bias. Now, I will admit that in the precious metal space, there are a number of uh, people who kind of use hype. I would say that King World News probably fits in there. Um, maybe some of the Sprott people a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say Mike Maloney. Maybe uh, Daniel Vision Victory, there's some hype there. Uh, but I wouldn't call them charlatans. Um, I think that, you know, Silver Doctors is another one selling silver. And a lot of people say, well, well, if you believe in silver, why are you selling it? Uh, that's another accusation that's come against um, Chris Duane. And I, I don't think it's really a legit accusation. I think really for the most part, these people are buying what they believe in. They're also selling it and making a profit which makes perfect sense if you believe that silver is manipulated down and that they're forcing the price down and you are in the process of stacking it, then it makes perfect sense that you would also sell it if you could get it in lots and make a profit off of the decline and use that to stack more. So I don't see that as a completely inconsistent position, but I will agree with him that there has been a lot of hype I won't use the term charlatan, so let's continue reading. Since it's the holiday and I'm feeling generous, I figured I'd write a post about the most ignorant meme touted across the precious metals blogosphere in the second half of 2015. 
I want you to keep in mind, dear reader, that you will get the opposite of confirmation bias from this post. This post will cl clearly explain to you how the guru you hold in such high esteem is consistently demonstrating his own ignorance. The question for you to decide is, are you being misled out of ignorance? Are you listening to an idiot or malice? Are you listening to a con man? Let's get to it. Have you seen the chart that looks like this, breathlessly ranting about the COMEX leverage ratio or paper gold cover ratio? And this is the chart. This is uh, claims on deliverable ounces. In this post, I'll explain to you why this chart is nonsensical and thus why no one else should be surprised that this ratio doesn't correlate with the price of gold. For background, I suggest you read an important post I wrote more than two years ago titled Precious Metal Charlatans Freaks of the Industry, where I explain how the then go-to meme about registered and eligible inventory at the comics was utter nonsense. And this is going to be the two categories he's going to be talking about registered gold and silver and eligible gold and silver. Then as now, we should start with the definition of registered and eligible metal. We don't need to speculate on what that definition is. We can look it up right in the rule book. Eligible shall mean with respect to any metal that such metal is acceptable for delivery against the applicable metal futures contract for which a warrant has not been issued Registered shall mean an eligible metal for which a warrant has been issued. A warrant shall mean a document of title issued by a licensed facility. So there's the difference. Uh, a eligible, it doesn't have a warrant issued against it. Registered means that there, a warrant has been issued. Let's step back for a moment and review how the COMEX works. The COMEX is an exchange. It matches buyers and sellers of futures contracts and facilitates settlement between the two. A COMEX future is a contract for the seller to deliver to the buyer at a time of the seller's choosing during the delivery month, the reference underlying quantity of metal. For gold, this contract size is 100 ounces. The seller transfers the electronic warrant to the buyer, which satisfies the delivery requirements. In my prior post on the subject, I explained what we would see in the daily spreadsheet published by the COMEX that quantifies warehouse inventories. Now, long after... Now, after the long takes delivery, the long can do whatever he wants with the warrant. He may, one, detach the warrant, converting the metal from registered to eligible. He may, two, take the metal out, bring it home, and bury it in his backyard. Or three, he may simply hold it as is and sell his warrant next month or not. What will we see in the depository inventory spreadsheet in each of these scenarios in number one? The registered metal decreases while the eligible metal increases. Number two, registered metal decreases. Number three, no change in either category. Are you with me so far? So what's the moronic meme behind this post? Some precious metal analysts have latched on to the ratio of total open interest to registered inventory. They have redefined registered inventory in a number of ways in order to try to give this meaningless ratio some sort of implied legitimacy for readers who don't know any better. As we'll see in a moment, the mistake these charlatans made was that they all started off as equating registered gold with the only gold available to be delivered. That's false, and basing a thesis on this false foundation leads to a rabbit hole of nonsense and hype. All gold in the COMEX warehouse is available to be delivered. It leads... It just needs a warrant attached to it, which makes it registered. Here's where some will get confused and think I'm making a nitpicking semantic argument, but I think it's easily understood by the square rectangle analogy. All squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Similarly, all registered gold is deliverable, but not all deliverable gold is registered. But I want you to forget about that for a moment and focus on the practical reality of how the COMEX works. Every short on the COMEX who wishes to deliver metal has to acquire suitable gold, attach a warrant to it if it doesn't already have one attached, and then notify the exchange of his intention to deliver. The author who, authors who talk about leverage ratio, deliverable gold, or gold available for delivery are somehow assuming that there is some public pool of gold which shorts just rush in, rush to in order to make delivery, grab the gold as fast as they can, first come, first served, and then whichever shorts don't get their hands on gold are screwed, and the comics defaults, etc., etc., etc. This is false. It's worth noting 
that most of the authors above are careful to note that they don't expect an imminent COMEX default, which is all the indication you should need that they are well aware that they're spouting nonsense. After all, if this open interest slash registered ratio mattered, it would be impossible for any sane person not to think it would cause problems at the COMEX. And so that's his main point. I generally tend to agree, but uh, I, I wanted to add some caveats. First of all, I don't attach any importance to the COMEX anyway. I've already cited FOFOA's uh, mentioning of the fact that the COMEX only delivers 5% of the silver, and I believe, and gold that is actually delivered in the world. So much of the delivered silver and gold is delivered if, on the LBMA and a lot, uh, a large, even larger amount than that, I believe, is, is delivered directly from the miners um, to, the, to the users. So he's correct on that. Uh, I think that looking at the COMEX to try to decide if there's going to be some kind of imminent default, um, I think that's a mistake. But then again, as far as silver is concerned, let's take a look and see exactly what is available to be delivered. Now, this is a, a, it may be that he's talking about Harvey Organ in this. So this is Harvey Organ's January 12th uh, release and you can see here that uh, Harvey cites uh, he, he likes to cite the number of contracts etc and you can see here um, what we actually have in silver on the COMEX. In silver we had no changes to inventory. Inventory rests at 316 million ounces. Now I believe that uh, that's a combination of the uh, of both of those. So what are we talking about when we're talking about 316 million ounces? Well, we're talking about significantly more than the mint's probably going to use because we know that even though we had record uh, silver eagles, um, it's nowhere near that number. It's between 50 and 100. But what does that amount to? Well, if you do the math, we've got $13, $14 silver and 316 million ounces. We're talking roughly $4 billion. So the question is not what is available to be delivered on the COMEX and is the COMEX near imminent default because of the registered versus eligible. The question really is uh, why isn't anybody taking delivery of this silver that's on the COMEX and uh, also the silver that's at the LBMA. And I've covered this many times before. The reason why they are not taking delivery of this silver is because they can't, because they've been told that they can't, because the powers that be have forbidden them from doing it. We know that this number here of 316 million ounces, and again, I believe that's uh, registered and eligible, that is only $4 billion. That is literally a rounding error. It's not only a rounding error in the national debt figures or even the deficit figures, it's a rounding error in the stock market figures as far as uh, what's happened to stocks. It's a rounding error in this Glencore stock market cap. It's a rounding error in everything. So the issue really isn't whether you know we're on the edge of uh, registered and eligible COMEX default and things like that. That's not the issue at all. The issue is when will the powers that be and the powers that be at some point will give the order. I, I do believe that. I do believe that the powers that be uh, believe that the system is doomed, that the, that the system is going to collapse. Now the question is, when will the powers that be give the order to let things collapse? I believe that when the powers that be give the order to let things collapse, then just as we're seeing this move here in the Dow um, dropping very violently uh, as soon as the Fed began to change the interest rates, I believe that with silver uh, we will see those ounces that are on the COMEX, which again only amount to about four billion dollars worth of silver. I believe that we will see those sucked up uh, in a very short amount of time. 
Now, I don't even know if those ounces exist. Uh, it may be, uh, there's no way for us to know. There, it, it may be that they have those registered and eligible ounces on the COMEX, but it may be that, that they're lying and that silver isn't even there. It may be that the silver on the SLV isn't there. We just have no way of knowing. But I believe that when they decide to pull the plug uh, and give the order to let those ounces go one way or another, to let large buyers actually come in and purchase those ounces, uh, then the amount of money that it will take will change the course of this market and uh, the explosion to the upside will be something to behold. And we'll talk to you next time.